And this morning, I want to look at knowing the benefits of joy. Every single one of us has encountered joy, haven't we? When you lift a little baby up in your arms and it starts to laugh at you, I have a little YouTube uh, video. And when you go on to it, the first video you will see is little Brooke just laughing. And when you see her laughing, it just makes you laugh. And when you see a little baby just laughing or you see someone else laughing, it can be contagious. And I really believe that laughter can change situations and circumstances. The joy of God can turn things around and make you look at things in a different perspective. I want to just look at two verses to start off with this morning. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I love that last bit. Against such things, there is no law. What does that mean? It means you can laugh as much as you want. You can have as joy as much as you want. You can have gentleness as much as you want. You can have self-control as much as you want. You can have patience as much as you want. There's no limit on it whatsoever. The fruit of the Spirit. If we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we have this fruit within. We've got all the joy that we will ever need in life. We've got all the patience that we will ever need in life. And we've got all the love that we will ever need in life. But I want to focus on this joy, this joy that God has given us all. It's a joy that passes all understanding. It's a joy that is deeper than just laughter. It is a joy that is given to you and I so that no matter what we go through, we can pull on to God's joy and God's goodness and see us come through the other sides. These fruit of the Spirit are the new character that God has given us. God has given you a new character. He's given you one that has the potential to be full of joy. It's not good news this morning. We're in a world of so much sadness. We're in a, a, a world of so much rubbish going on that we need this new character kicking in. The enemy doesn't want you operating in the joy of God. Because when you don't operate in this joy, he can steal your goods. He can steal what God has given you. So the enemy doesn't want you to operate in joy. He doesn't want you to operate in God's joy. He doesn't want you to really know what it can do, what it has for you, and what it can bring you through. I remember when our little daughter Paula, she was fighting for her life. She's coming 22 now, but when she was only born, they told us that if she was to live, it's the probability she would have brain damage. She swallowed a substance called meconium, which was basically a bowel movement, and she swallowed this, and it stopped her going to the brain. And they told us that it was life-threatening. I got a phone call from a prisoner about a year ago, and he said, Fred, can you pray for the family? The little baby died. And he said it, 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 it swallowed something. I says, meconium. He says, that's it? How did you know I says, because my little daughter, she swallowed the same stuff. And uh, I realized the seriousness of it just a year ago. And I started to get a joy within me because I seen our little daughter, Paula, grow up. And now we've got our own little granddaughter who's running about and smelling the people and everything else. But I realized, wow, God, you saved me through that. And you give me the strength even when I was going through it. I remember that night coming away and going to church on the Sunday night. 
And people expected me not to be at church. I couldn't understand that. Why would people not expect me to be at church? A place that's going to uplift me? A place where there's people going to be around me to encourage me, to strengthen me, to pray for me, to be there for me? Why would I not want to go to church? You know, when Gladys' daughter passed away to glory, people expected Gladys not to be at church on the Sunday. But why, Gladys said to me, why would it not be where people are there so I can praise God together? A place of uplifting a place where God's joy should be evident and should be seen. And God's joy was more than just a smile. It was able for me to go through and to face whatever I was going to face. We've all got this joy within us. Ephesians 4 and 24 says, Put on the new self, create it, to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we need to put this joy on at times to realize, hey, I've got the joy of God. I've got this joy that can bring me strength, that can bring me through the other side. We can be happy anywhere when we feel like it, can't we? We can be happy walking down the street. We can be happy in our house. And I believe that happiness is a choice. It's something you choose to do. And happiness is a feeling, isn't it? It's an emotion. And it's great to be happy. One of the things that I do is when people are coming into the office at times and they're, they're burdened down with some stuff, I try to make light harder things. I try to get them to laugh. I try to get them to laugh at something stupid I've did or something stupid they've did or something stupid somebody did. Just try to get them to laugh. Because I know when people start to laugh, what it does is it sends those endorphins. It sends just stuff to the brain and starts to make things look a little bit better. We also can say things like, I'm not going to be happy until my finances change. I'm not going to be happy until this happens. I'm not going to happy, be happy until something else happens. I want to say this to you. If you're waiting on certain things to change, you may never be happy because sometimes you go through things and through things. And the key is learning to be happy through the midst of them, not waiting for them to go away. Because when something happens and it changes the situation, and that problem that you had is a way. You can be sure that there's five more trying to get in the door. You can be sure that there's other stuff trying to come and trying to bring you to a place where you're relying on your feelings and your emotions. If I was to rely on my feelings and emotions, I wouldn't get up a bed, out of bed some weeks. I would stay in bed all week. If I was to rely on my feelings and my emotions, I would walk about with a face so long and wouldn't want to look at anybody because your emotions and feelings will say, what have you got to laugh about? What have you got to do this? What have you got to do that? And your emotions and feelings lie to you so much. They really do. You see, this joy is being secure in Jesus no matter what your circumstances can I say that again? This joy is being secure in Jesus no matter what your circumstances. Can I say it again? This joy is being secure in Jesus no matter what your circumstances. Because circumstances will come and go. I've had days where I've had plenty of money. I've had days when I've had little money. I've had days when I've had plenty of this and plenty of that and plenty of the other. They come and they go. We shouldn't base our joy on what we have, but on who we've got living within us. James said this. He says, consider it pure joy when you're going through trials. I don't like that. How can you consider it Pure joy when you're going through trials, when you're going through rubbish, when you're going through some stuff. How can you consider it pure joy? What he's saying is, consider who you've got living within you, who can bring you through, 
and bring you through to the other side. Now, when he was speaking to this, he was speaking this to a persecuted church. He was speaking this to the 12 tribes who had been scattered. And these 12 tribes had seen loved ones killed, destroyed. They had run away from their homes. They had seen their homes in flames. They had seen disaster upon disaster. They had seen households wiped out. And here James is trying to encourage them and stir them up. And he says, consider it pure joy that you've lost your home. Uh Uh-uh. Consider it pure joy that you've lost your family. What are you saying, James? He's trying to encourage them. Listen, you're still here. You've still got hope. You've still got purpose. You've got something to live for. Take hold of what you've got now. Yesterday's gone. Last week's gone. We can't do nothing about that. And James is saying, come on, take hold of what you've got. Realize what you have. But most of all, realize that Jesus is in the boat. Do you see when the storm was on the lake, basically coming against the boat, and the disciples were panicking. It says that there were other boats in the lake. And when the waters calmed down, what actually happened was the other boats were saved too. And the reason why the other boats were saved, because Jesus was in the boat of the disciples. You see, Jesus is in your boat this morning. He's living within you. And because of you, other people will be saved. Other people will be saved because of you. Other people will be touched because of you. Other people will be reached because of you. This week, we've got the Irish team coming over. I'm so excited because I know that they'll be able to do much more than I can do. And when the 12 of them come over, they'll be able to reach into other people's lives. And us together will see other people touched by the love and the joy of God. When you're securing Jesus, Satan knows that he can't steal your joy. He knows that he can't steal this joy. So therefore, he tries to get you to a place that you're insecure. Am I really a Christian? I don't know if I am a Christian. I don't know if I am this. Has God really come into my life? Have I really took hold of God? Is God's word really true? Is it important to get into fellowship? Is it important to pray? He tries to get you unbalanced so that therefore when you start to doubt these things, then he'll come and he'll try to knock you off your perch. And then he will steal your joy. King David had so much joy in his life. And he writes about it in the Psalms. But he also knew what it was like to lose his joy. Sin crept into his life. And when sin crept into his life, it started to steal his joy. And he said this, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Restore unto me. He knew that without this joy, his life was miserable. He knew without this joy, his life was just going through emotions. I want to encourage you this morning. Realize that you have this joy. And when you get up in the morning, thank God for it. Take hold of it. And when you walk out, just walk down the street Pass the trees and say, the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Walk a pass down the, the, the estuary and think, thank you, Lord, that you've given me another day. Do you know what? God has placed you in this beautiful town. He's placed you in beautiful Millam. Beautiful Millam is not just a place, but a home. He's placed you here. He's given you joy. He's given you hope. And he wants you to bring it to others. You see, joy can do so much. Joy can bring you into a place that when things are coming against you, that you will be able to just walk right through it and walk through the other side. You know, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were in the fiery furnace, when they were walking along and Jesus was walking along with them in that fiery furnace, do you think they were sad? 
where? They would have been rejoicing. If I'd have been there, I'd have been trying to do a wee Irish jig. I'd have been dancing away saying, you thought you were going to kill me, King Nebuchadnezzar, but I'm alive and Jesus has rescued me. Look, my heart's not even singed. I'd have been full of joy. But you know what? Before they even went into the fiery furnace, they were filled with joy. It may not have been expressing itself through dancing and all their emotions, but this is what they said. When he said to them, if you don't bow down and worship me or worship the statue, the 90 foot statue by name, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And these little Jewish boys said, listen, King Neb, it doesn't matter what you do. Our God's able to save us. But you see, if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down and worshiping you. I want to encourage you this morning. That was joy of God birthing within them. That was joy of God raising up within them. It doesn't matter what you throw at me, devil. I'm going to keep on worshiping God. I'm keep, going to keep on praising him. I'm going to keep on looking to him. Nehemiah, when they were trying to build the walls, showed another aspect of joy. He knew that the joy of the Lord was able to be his strength. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food, sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is a sacred day to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to say to, to the king, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you threw at me. That's why the people were being persecuted. And GM said, listen, come on. The joy of the Lord is your strength, church. Consider it pure joy, because that's why you've been able to go through what you faced and what you went through. You see, the people of Jerusalem, they were joyful for the books of the law, the Torah. And when it was read to them, it brought real joy into their lives. We should be so grateful for this word because there's so much promises. There's so much hope. There's so much blessings. There's so much stuff in there that when we read this and we take hold of it, we can see that we can get through whatever ever we have to face. Psalm 16, verse 16 says this, You have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence and eternal pleasures at your hand. You fill me with joy in your presence. When we spend time with God, we get to understand that joy afresh. We start to smile and laugh and people wonder, well, what's going on? I really believe it's important to help ourselves remember that we've got this joy within us because there's so much tragedy going on and they don't have the joy and the hope. Do you ever see some of the third world countries and you see the little black kids and they haven't got anything but they're running about happy and smiling and enjoying what they've got? That always makes me smile and makes me ponder in my heart because it doesn't take much really in life to make us happy. I'm so glad that I'm married to Lorraine. I really am. Lorraine has the most beautiful humor you ever did meet. And some of you probably don't know it, but she makes me laugh so much. And some of the things she says, I steal them and I put them on Facebook and I use them. And you think, oh, the pastor's so funny. It's not, it's my wife. She's the, honestly, when you spend some time and you get her relaxing, 
She'll just come off with such of the most funniest things. Sometimes some of the most stupidest things. And they make us laugh too. But you know, I'm glad I'm Irish. Because God made the Irish to be able to laugh at themselves. To be able to have a humor when they're dying and they're facing a famine. To be able to crack jokes about their own tragedies. A joy. God has given you a joy this morning. Do you know that laughter is the best medicine? It's claimed that. Doctors, researchers, scientists in the United States, what they realized was this, that if they showed cartoons, something funny, something that would be uplifting, that their whole character changed, that their whole person personality changed. One of my funniest clips you ever did see, I have it on my, my YouTube, and it's only fools and horses. And it's about the one about Batman. You all know the one, don't you? And this uh, council worker, she's being mugged. And they have dressed up to go to this place where they were told that was a fancy dress that actually wasn't a fancy dress. It was actually a funeral they were going to and they didn't realize this. But the fact is, they're dressed up as Batman and Robin and she's being mugged and as they're running down, she looks and the gangsters or the people who were stealing the money, they look too and they bolted because they see Batman and Robin running down the street. It's funny. It can change your attitude. The ways this man on the earth, King Solomon, he wrote some things about it. Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed heartache crushes the spirit. Wow. A cheerful heart is like good medicine. I remember when we were living in Glenbrim Park, when I used to come out of the house, I used to always have a smile on my face. Hope I've still got a smile on my face. I mean, not as much as I had then. But I always had a smile on my face. And one day, little Colin Crulo, he seen me walking out of the house, and I didn't have a smile. And he said to his mommy, he was about five or six, Mommy, there's something wrong with Freddie. She says, what do you mean? He walked out of the house this morning without a smile. People look at you. Now, our joy is more than a smile, but I have made it my life to, to try not to look to the circumstances, but to look what I have. You know, my, my head could be falling off, and you might say to me, well, Fred, how are you doing? And my answer will be, I'm blessed. And you might say to me, how are you really doing? I'll say, I'm wonderfully blessed. I'm fantastic because of who's living within me. You see, it doesn't matter what's going on in the circumstances, it's who you are. I've got the joy of Jesus living within my life. When I go into the prison, I make it a goal. As soon as I open those gates, as soon as I go in, I see those officers whose faces are down like this and people's heads are down to smile, to talk, to encourage Gene walks along with me. Gene, it takes us a half an hour sometimes to get across the other side of the wing. And they'll say to me, how are you doing? I'll go, I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. And they don't know what's been going on that week. That I've had 15 complaints from people out of the fellowship. The 22 have left the church. <laughs> and my wife's planning to leave me on the next boat. They don't know any of this is going on. And that's all an exaggeration, by the way. And they don't need to know. You don't need to know what's going on in my life sometimes. But sometimes it's important to share to those people that you can trust and they do pray you through. But at the end of the day, we don't really need to know the specifics of people's lives. Because when you start to tell them what's going on in your life, you start to see that they're not really listening anyway. Sure they're not. When you start to tell people, oh, well, I'm going to the doctors and I've got five doctor's appointments and I have to go to the hospital three times, they forget you even, don't they? They don't realize. And then they're looking for you in the, the morning when you're not at the prayer meeting, they're going to go down and kick your door in because they think you're not there because they haven't listened. Let's face it, 
when people start to go off about their woes and their troubles, we'll listen a bit, but we start to think about our own at times. So the secret is, see what the Word says. Take hold of what God's Word says. Start to speak God's Word out. I remember one day I was feeling really down. And I went in. I says, I've had enough of this. I'm fed up being down. So I got different verses in the Bible. I looked up the concordance that had joy in it. And I started to read all these joy verses. After a half an hour, I was on top of the world. Even though the problems were still the same, I started to take hold of this word. I started to speak it out. I started to proclaim it. And as I started to proclaim it, it started to do something within. It started to take away the heaviness. It started to take away the lies. It started to take away the depression or the oppression or whatever was coming in. King Solomon also says in 1513, a happy heart makes the face cheerful. But a heartache crushes the spirit. We've happy hearts this morning. We've got the joy of God. And sometimes I'll just say things to bring a smile to somebody's face because that changes the situation. Joyfulness, it's a choice. We can choose how we feel and how we react. We can choose this. James shows us this in James 5, 13. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. We'll read that out again. Is anyone in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. It's a choice, people. This joy that we have in our hearts, it's a choice. It's a choice to walk in it, to take hold of it, to believe it, to let it be birthed within us. I want to just say to you this morning, how's your joy? How's your joy this morning? Do you need it restored this morning? Have you let it go? Have you let it slip within you? How's your joy this morning? Romans fourteen seventeen. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want to conclude now, and I want to just say this. Joy is a wonderful thing. It's not about how we feel, because our feelings change every day depending on the many factors and the many things that are going on. Joy is a thermometer. As we get closer to God, as we spend time with God, joy goes up. Wow. As we spend intimacy with Jesus, our joy goes up. Can I say that again? As we spend intimacy with Jesus, our joy goes up. If you don't have much joy operating in your life, it's because you're not spending much time with Jesus. That's the simplicity of it. As we spend time with Jesus, our joy goes up. As we get closer to God, our joy goes up. And as we step further, away from God, our joy goes down. As we step further away, the depression that we had starts to come back. Because I want to say this, there's people in this fellowship who have took hold of Jesus, and when they've took hold of Jesus and they're drawn close to Jesus, their depression seems to go. Wow! That's because the joy is overriding it. The joy of God is overriding the depression. The joy of God is taking it away. The joy of God's giving you a new perspective. I have seen people set free from depression, but I've seen people walk back in it again. I've seen Christians who have been walking through and walking out of depression. I remember baptizing a guy here three years ago. He was a and he stood up and he publicly declared, I'm free from the depression. And he was. 
He declared he was free. But what happened was this. He moved to another place. He stopped going to church. He stopped getting involved. He stopped spending time with God. And I said to him, how are you doing? He says, my depression's back. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. That helps you overcome those things. That helps you overcome those situations. When I'm spending time with Jesus, I find that no matter what, I've got the strength to be able to overcome. So the thermometer goes up. How does the doctors try to get rid of depression? They give you happy pills. That's what they do. They give you happy pills. They give you pills to try to get you happy. Come on, get into this word. Get spending time with Jesus and you'll start to realize, hey, I don't need those happy pills anymore. The lads in the prison will say to me, they'll say, Fred, what have you been on today? And I'll say, I've been on a J-top. They'll go, what, Fred? What's a J-top? I'll go, Jesus. Come on. Jesus is my J-top. That's the only pill I need to pop in the morning. Jesus spending time with him you know we have prayer meetings we've had early morning prayer meetings going on for nine years and people have thought well that will give them up no do you know why we don't because even if I'm there it gets me disciplined it gets me up out of my bed because I know I have to go and pray and I know that that time with other Christians that time is so valuable because that time gives me the strength to face the day How's your joy thermometer this morning? Is it up or is it down? Hope after this message it's up. But you know what? It can go down so quickly because the enemy will just try to come in and steal your joy. The joy that God's given you. I want to encourage you this morning. Do me a favor today. Tell someone to laugh at something. Encourage them to laugh. Just have fun with somebody. Have fun. Let them start moaning. Just cut in and tell them something stupid. And they'll laugh at you. At least you get them to laugh. Sometimes I do things stupid to get people to laugh at not, not, not all of the time. Most of the time I just do things stupid. But the fact is, sometimes it's just important to do something. Just so that people can have a life. I just wanted to say this to you. I'm a prayer of profession. I'm going to get a confess and just to speak this on. I want you to speak it out after me. Just to declare to the heavenlies, just to declare to the principalities, to the powers, this confession. Just say it after me. Father in heaven, I thank you that I have your joy. And this day, it is restored unto me. And I'm going to walk in this joy. This joy that brings me strength. This joy that gives me hope. This joy that gives me purpose. And this joy that helps me get through the week. Because I can do it with your strength. Amen.